Greetings. My name is C.J. Levick, and I am the author and founder of Rock Island Books. I trust you will be blessed as you view this video, and I would like to invite you to assist Rock Island Books in our urgent desire to proclaim the very soon coming of our Lord and the very soon coming of the 70th week of Daniel. The world is about to change in ways we can hardly imagine, and when it does... I am convinced that almost all Christian YouTube videos and Christian media will be censored or removed from the Internet. When we are gone, what will the world think? Will they believe the lies that will be told about our disappearance? Please consider assisting us in getting this message into the places that cannot be canceled by going to Rock Island Books and purchasing one of our 2024 Prophetic Prophecy series, presented on DVDs that cannot be canceled in order that those that remain will have a testimony that might just be the very thing that leads them to the Lord, who is now and always the only hope for lost and dying people and the lost and dying world that is literally passing away. Let me introduce you to the mystery of the blessed hope. Romans 8:18, 8, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. And from Hebrews 9.28, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. I want to begin this video grounded with the firm expectation that those of us that are in Christ are on the cusp of realizing the blessed hope, while the world is on the cusp of realizing the great and terrible day of the Lord that begins with the 70th week of Daniel, also known as the time of Jacob's trouble. Please listen carefully to the revelation of the Holy Spirit delivered unto the Apostle Paul in order that we might hear God's promise and be filled with outrageous faith and overflowing hope, and then contrast that with the message of horrific doom that is appointed to happen after the blessed hope, after that's been realized, and the promise Yeshua made to his disciples in John 14 has been actualized. So continuing reading from Romans 8, verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Does this describe you? Are you filled with faith? hoping for, longing for the deliverance from the bondage of corruption that is the birthright and the certain harbinger of death that every person born into this world is headed for as a result of the sin of the first man, Adam? Adam, the first sinner, whose DNA we host and whose sin and rebellion we discover within ourselves manifesting itself with unrelenting stubbornness and persistent regularity. Have you reconciled yourself to your own destiny absent a divine intervention, absent a promise of a future bright and hopeful? This long video you are invited to watch has a purpose that transcends the fact that we have reached the terminal point in world history where the Lord is about to interrupt the daily rhythm of life for the entire world in ways we cannot now fully comprehend. But don't take my word for it. The Lord of creation has declared it to be true and has described it with horrifying details. Clearly, what is coming is not like anything we have ever experienced on the earth or in all the history of man. Listen to what it says in Zephaniah 1, 14-18. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near, and hasteth greatly, 
Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man, shall cry there bitterly. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpets and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all of them that dwell in the land. And in Jeremiah 30, starting with verse 4, we read this, And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. In Matthew 24, starting in verse 21, we read, For then shall be a great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. So here we have it. Two destinies, both laid out with crisp and unmistakable clarity. One destiny for those that are in Christ, a remnant of believers who with childlike faith have received the gracious gift of salvation based on the redemption accomplished on the cross of Calvary, a remnant that love the Lord and His promises, having abandoned any hope or future in this present world. A remnant looking upwards, waiting for their salvation to arrive as the Lord promised it would. God's children ignited by the blessed hope. What will become of this remnant? We do not need to wonder, as the Apostle Paul brings us a message directly from Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 51, we read, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in Titus 2, verses 13 and 14, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Another for those that are presently in a condition of judicial blindness as a result of the rejection of Messiah. A different destiny, a people who have received great and glorious promises from the Lord but have lost their way and apart from a gracious work of discipline are beyond recovery a people who are about to experience the Lord's rod. And what will this rod of correction, this fiery furnace of tribulation produce? We do not need to wonder, as the Lord tells us in advance. We can read about it in Zechariah 13, verses 6 and 8 through 9. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And it shall come to pass, that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third part shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and I will refine them as silver is refined, 
and I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. Based on my understanding of the Lord's 7,000-year calendar, we are about to enter the final seven years that complete the 6,000 years that God appointed for man to work. The final seven years that will complete the 70th week of Daniel. Two monumental events are about to take place, and apparently in short order, if not one after the other or at the same time. These two events will mark the end of the church age while it announces the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. We are approaching and almost at the crossroads that cannot be delayed and will happen without fanfare as the Lord tells us in advance that it will be like the days of Noah. Bible scholars have wondered and argued for years about the Lord's prediction that His coming would be like the days of Noah. Was this second coming? Was this about the rapture? Matthew twenty four thirty seven tells us, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Does this happen at the end of the tribulation? Obviously not as we read that it comes at a time when man's life is unperturbed, eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage. This does not describe the end of the tribulation, but it does describe the beginning of the tribulation. Who is Christ coming for then? Isn't the answer obvious? He's coming for his church, the bride. You can read about this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall be with the Lord forever. Therefore encourage each other with these words. Could it be any clearer? The Lord is coming to deliver those of us who are in Christ from the wrath to come. It is a snatching away at exactly the right moment, as judgment is about to come upon the earth. When is this appointed to happen? The answer is that the 70th week of Daniel will begin on the Day of Atonement in the fall of 2024. How can I know this, you wonder? The answer to that question will be found in the final 16 minutes of this video where you will find a brief summary of some of the most important dates on the Lord's 7,000-year prophetic sabbatical calendar. This summary will be added to all Rock Island Book prophetic videos that will be found on YouTube that begin with the title 2024. It is my goal to produce the most authoritative publication of the 7,000-year sabbatical calendar that's ever been produced, and I can almost guarantee you it will probably be the one and only comprehensive sabbatical calendar perspective ever produced using Scripture alone. The pre-tribulation rapture perspective is clearly out of favor. Now that does not surprise me. And there are many that get red-faced and obstinate if you even bring up the topic. I think it is time to have a thoughtful discussion about this most important topic in light of the Scriptures alone. Now those of you that have followed my ministry for years know that my focus has not been on the rapture. It has been on the timing of what is commonly called the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble. I believe it can be demonstrated based on the Bible alone that this event is the last event to take place at the end of the 6,000 years starting from when the first Adam sinned. I also believe that there is one event that precedes this seven-year period of time that puts an explanation mark at the exact end of the 6,000 years God has appointed for mankind based on his 7,000-year sabbatical calendar. That event is the departure of the Bride of Christ, the departure of the called-out assembly called the Church. Now, I understand that this is a hotly debated topic, and with that in mind, I would like to put before you an abbreviated list of 22 reasons why the departure of the called-out assembly, known as the Church, and the second coming of Christ are both connected in ways most have not considered 
while they are separated by a period of time that is seven years long. Notice I did not say seven or more years, which is what my fellow pre-tribulation saints have been repeating and are repeating over and over. The reason for that is simple. I believe the 70th week of Daniel is going to happen, for reasons we will outline using the authority of the Old Testament prophets alone, on a timeline that's been revealed in the Bible alone, that will unfold in the fall of the very year this video is being produced. Now it stands to reason if the 70th week of Daniel is going to begin on the Day of Atonement in the fall of 2024, and that event will be preceded by the departure of the church, then obviously the appointed time for both this is the same year, and since the second coming happens at the end of the seven years we call the time of Jacob's trouble, then the number of years between them is seven years. Debating this is senseless, as the time of reckoning is just months away, so why not just allow yourself to consider the possibility based on the scriptural proofs that will be offered as evidence, and let's see what happens. Now to be fair, the following 22 reasons, what we call the rapture and the second coming, does not rule out other time duration perspectives. To be fair, it is fair to ask if there might be another time span, another prophetic perspective besides the seven year period of time. Now I believe with all my heart that seven years is correct. But I would still answer that question, yes. There could be another time period as some suggest. Could it be 1260 days, three and a half years into the time of Jacob's trouble when the church is evacuated as some believe? While it is possible, it is also my opinion that it's highly unlikely for all sorts of reasons. If the rapture does not materialize before the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, then I think there will be many who will take that position more seriously. But for now, let's just wait and watch expectantly as we live each day knowing that his coming is absolutely imminent. We are the terminal generation, and most of us who are in Christ alive today will experience the snatching away the scriptures promise those who are in Christ. Now please consider the 22 reasons why the rapture and the second coming are not the same. This is being presented with scriptural references, and to make checking this out easier for you, we will be publishing this entire teaching that includes actually publishing the scripture verses. So if you go to rockislandbooks.com, and click the What We Believe, you will find this document available for your consideration. So now let's consider reason number one. The rapture of the church, asking the question, who goes and who stays? Well, in the rapture, all believers are removed from the earth. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54. The second coming of Christ, asking the question, who goes and who stays? The second coming will result in removal of all unbelievers from the earth. Matthew 24, 37 through 41. Number two, the rapture of the church asking the question, who comes and who goes? Well, the answer is, Christ comes for his own. John 14, verse 3, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1. The second coming of Jesus Christ asking the question, who comes and who goes? The answer is, he comes with his own. In 1 Thessalonians 3.13, Jude 1.14, and Revelation 19.14-16 through 16 reveal that truth. Number three, the rapture of the church asking the question, in other words, comes to collect his bride from the earth. 1 Thessalonians 4.16-17. The second coming of Christ, asking the question, coming with his bride back to the earth. Revelation 19, 14 through 16. Number four, the rapture of the church, asking the question, what about the Father's house? Answer, those that belong to Christ will be taken to the Father's house. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. Where is that house, by the way? It's in heaven. The second coming of Jesus Christ asking the question, what about the Father's house? Those saved out of the tribulation will not see the Father's house. Revelation 20, 4 through 5. Number 5, the rapture of the church asking the question, who is it all about? The answer, the focus and object of attention is the Lord's church. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 15-17. What about the second coming of Jesus Christ? Asking the question, who is that all about? The focus and object of attention is Israel and the kingdom. Matthew 24, verse 14. Number 6. Considering the rapture of the church and asking the question, what is the location of Christ's coming? The answer, Christ comes in the clouds and believers meet Jesus in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. What about the second coming of Jesus Christ? Asking the question, what is the location of Christ's coming? The answer, Christ comes to the earth and sets his feet on solid ground. Zechariah 14, 4. Acts 1, verse 11. Number 7. Considering the rapture of the church, asking the question, what happens next? The answer, the next prophetic event is the Great Tribulation, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-9. The second coming of Christ, asking the question, what happens next? Well, the answer is the establishment of the millennial kingdom here on the earth, Revelation 20, 7, and 8. Number 8. The rapture of the church asking the question, signs or no signs? Well, the answer is, no signs precede the rapture of the church. Now considering the second coming of Jesus Christ, asking the question, are there signs or no signs? The answer, many signs precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. You can read about this in Luke 21, 11 through verse 15. Number 9. The rapture of the church asking the question, what happens after Jesus comes? Answer. Jesus will gather his bride to himself for the preparation of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, 6-9. What about the second coming of Jesus Christ? Asking the question, what happens after Jesus comes? Well, the answer is Jesus will execute judgment on the earth and establish his kingdom. Zechariah 14, 3-4, Jude 1, 14-15, and Revelation 19, 11-21. Number 10. The rapture of the church asking the question, How quickly does Jesus come? Well, the answer is, in the rapture, Jesus comes in the twinkling of an eye. Only the believers will see the Lord, and only after they have been glorified. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. What about the second coming of Jesus Christ? Asking the question, How quickly does Jesus come? The answer is, it takes a while. Everyone will see Jesus coming with great power and authority. It does not happen in one instant. It happens over a period of time that everyone views. Zechariah 12, verse 10, Revelation 1, verse 7. Number 11. The rapture of the church asking the question, What about the resurrection of the dead? Well, the answer is, in the rapture, this includes the glorious resurrection of the dead who are in Christ, along with the translation of the living. You can read about this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. What about the second coming of Jesus Christ? Asking the question, what about the resurrection of the dead? There will be a resurrection of those who have died in the tribulation, those who were beheaded for not taking the mark of the beast. You can read about this in Revelation 20, verse 4. Number 12. The rapture of the church, asking the question, what about the angels? Answer, angels do not come to gather the church. Matthew 24, 31, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. What about the second coming of Jesus Christ? What about the angels then? Well, the answer is the angels come to gather the Jews from the four corners of the earth in order to transport them to Israel. Matthew 13, verse 39 verse 41 and verse 49, and Matthew 24, verse 31. Number 13. The rapture of the church asking the question, what about glorified resurrection bodies? The answer, those who have died in Christ will return with Jesus with their spirit bodies in order to receive their glorified resurrection bodies. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, you can read about this. The second coming of Jesus Christ asking the question, what about glorified resurrection bodies? Answer, Christians will return to the earth seven years later with Christ, having already been given a glorified resurrection body and another detail they're riding on a white horse. Revelation 19, verse 11. Number 14, the rapture of the church asking the question, where is the white horse? Jesus returns in the clouds, and he is not riding a white horse. 
the second coming of Jesus Christ, asking the question, where's the white horse? Well, the answer is Jesus will return riding a white horse. Revelation 19, verse 11. Number 15, the rapture of the church asking the question, good news or bad news, which is it? Well, the answer is Jesus comes with a message of hope and comfort. 1 Thessalonians 4.18, Titus 2.13, 1 John 3.3. 3. In the second coming of Jesus Christ, is it good news or bad news? Which is it? Well, you decide. Jesus is coming to judge the world. Malachi 4, verse 5, Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2. Number 16, the rapture of the church. What about Satan? Well, the world is found in a state of satanic deception. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 through 12. What about the second coming of Jesus Christ? What about Satan then? Well, the answer is Satan is bound by Christ's second coming by an angel and thrown into the abyss. Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2. Number 17. The rapture of the church asking the question, Who sees Jesus the Christ and who doesn't see Jesus the Christ? Well, the answer is in the rapture, only believers alive on the earth will see Jesus coming. What about the second coming of Jesus Christ? Who sees Jesus then? And who doesn't see Jesus Christ? Well, the Bible says that every eye will see Jesus. Every eye will see Jesus descend bodily and visibly. You can read about this in Acts 1, verses 9 through 11, and Matthew 24, verse 30. Number 18. What about the judgments? Well, for the believers who are raptured, there's the Bema Seat Rewards Judgment, the Seat of Christ. You read about this in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 11. What about judgments in the second coming of Jesus Christ? After the second coming, it will be followed by the judgments of the nations, also known as the sheep and goat judgment. You can read about this in Matthew 25, verse 31 through 45. Number 19. The rapture of the church asking the question, What kind of bodies will we have? The answer, The Christian saints will receive a new, immortal, glorified body that is like the body that Jesus has now. You can read about this in Philippians 3, verse 21, and 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 54. The second coming of Jesus Christ, what kind of bodies will we have then? The tribulation saints will enter the millennium with their earthly body that is like the body of the first Adam. We, the saints who are in Christ, will already have our glorified body. You can read about this in Isaiah 65, verse 20, and Revelation 20, verse 4. So considering the rapture of the church and asking the question, what about the Antichrist, the beast? The answer the Antichrist will be revealed and given a short period of time to deceive the entire world. You can read about this in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. The second coming of Jesus Christ asking the question, What about the Antichrist, the beast? The Antichrist is defeated along with the false prophet and cast into the lake of fire. You can read about this in Revelation 19, verse 20. 21. The rapture of the church asking the question, What about Israel? After the rapture, Israel is persecuted with two-thirds of the Jews perishing during the time of Jacob's trouble. One-third are refined by fire by the Lord and are saved in order to enter into the millennial kingdom. Zechariah 13, verses 8 and 9. The second coming of Jesus Christ asking the question, what about Israel? After the second coming, Israel is gathered and established as the head of the nations, with Jerusalem as the capital, ruled with a rod of iron by Yeshua. You can read about this in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 through 8. And finally, number 22, the rapture of the church asking the question, what about the new world order? After the rapture, the new world order is the dominant world government. The world will be plagued by famine, pestilence, and war as they experience God's wrath. Revelation 13, verse 15, Matthew 24, verses 6 through 10, and Luke 17, verse 31. And finally, the second coming of Jesus Christ asking the question, What about the new world order? After the second coming of Christ, the new world order is utterly destroyed as the kingdom of Yeshua is established 
with headquarters in Jerusalem where Yeshua reigns with a rod of iron for 1,000 years, bringing in peace and security. You can read about this in Isaiah 11, verse 6, and Daniel 2, verses 34 and 35. This concludes chapter 1. And while we are not going to take the time here to summarize all the differences, I would like to direct your attention to just two of the amazing and convincing distinctions between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. If you care to review chapter 1, these are the number one and the number fifteenth reason why the rapture and the second coming are not the same event. The number one distinction between the rapture and the second coming can be summarized based on who is taken up in the rapture and who is left behind and for what purpose. In other words, who goes and who stays and why are some taken and some left behind in the rapture? We find a great summary of this in Hebrews 9.28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is from the ESV English translation. Well, this verse is pretty straightforward and easy to understand. Christ came once to offer himself for the sins of many. This event is a once-in-a-lifetime, a once-for-all, never-to-be-repeated event. We know from other verses that Yeshua came to offer salvation to all, and for all, every single person who's ever lived. His death, the death of Christ, is sufficient to pay their sin debt. Of course, we also know that all have not and will not receive this free gift of salvation, but many will. It is the many who have trusted in him and are looking eagerly for him to return that is the focus of this revelation. Is that you? I sure hope so. Simply stated, the Lord says he is coming for them. The them is those that are looking eagerly for his coming. He's coming to save them. Well, what does this mean? Aren't we already saved? The answer is that if you have trusted in Christ, Christ alone for your salvation, acknowledged him as your creator and savior, then you have received the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit that is the internal certificate of your redemption based on the finished work of Christ on Calvary having your sins covered by his atoning blood. If this has happened in your life, then you are both redeemed and saved. Salvation has been accomplished on your behalf, and nothing can change that. Nothing can separate you from God's love, as demonstrated on the cross of Calvary. Nothing. But you have not experienced it fully or completely, and that is what the Lord is talking about in Hebrews 9.28. Let me read it again and then consider what the Lord is saying in the context of what the Lord reveals in Luke 21:28. So here we go. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And in Luke 21, 28, Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Notice that the same truth is being revealed in the Gospel of Luke, and the context is the same as we are told when we see the signs of his coming manifesting on the earth. We know that we are soon to be redeemed. In other words, those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, passport stamped by the indwelling Holy Spirit, adoption papers completed, all signed and sealed by heaven's magistrate, will experience the redemption that is a fact presently secured in heaven, personally to be made alive in us at a specific appointed time. And when is that? At his coming. Luke twenty one twenty eight again. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Redemption you have already received is about to be experienced. Notice, he is not coming to judge them as there is no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus except the rewards given at the judgment seat of Christ called the Bema Seat Judgment. Compare that to the verses that describe the final second coming of Christ at the end of the age, the end of Daniel's 70th week of years, that concludes the 6,000 years God has appointed for mankind. Here's just one verse, Acts 17.31, Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness, by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance to this, and all by raising him from the dead. 
Jesus is coming in the final stage of his second coming to judge the earth, not to escort his bride, the called out assembly known as the church, not to escort them to heaven as promised in John 14, where the Lord said he is coming to take them to the Father's house in heaven where he has prepared a place for them. When Christ comes to save, or as the scripture says, redeem the redeemed, He is not talking about physical salvation, although the snatching away we call the rapture does strongly hint that we are being removed from imminent danger. And in the general sense, we know that we are being removed so as to not to come under the wrath that God is going to pour out on an unbelieving and iniquitous world. If we are in Christ, we are saved and we are redeemed, as is evidenced by the living presence of the Holy Spirit who indwells us, notice that he is coming for those that are eagerly awaiting his coming. Is that a condition of our going to be with him? Well, it may not be, but if we take God's word seriously, you can see that the implication that the Lord expects is that those that have been redeemed by him will be eagerly awaiting his return, not swept up in the cares and culture of this present world. So, if the Word of God throws a caution sign up, then who am I to take it down? We are to eagerly await his return. Luke twenty one twenty eight. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. I will end chapter 1 with this encouraging proclamation by the Apostle Paul as found in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57. Listen carefully. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Exploring the Lord's 7,000-year sabbatical calendar. Connecting the prophecy dots in the Bible is like opening a thousand-piece puzzle box, dumping all the pieces on the table, and working tirelessly to assemble them. Well, actually, prophetic puzzles can be much more difficult, in fact, impossible without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and a bold faith that believes God and understands that God is never wrong, and that His Word is 100% trustworthy. We all struggle with our own spiritual blindness. God has no such problem, and he is kind and gracious to those who are seeking him with all their hearts in order to know him better, in order to understand him more fully, and the only way that happens is with his help. So I pray for his help as I do my best to share with you where we are on God's prophetic calendar. There are literally hundreds of prophetic puzzle pieces in the Bible, but just like the box that contains all the puzzle pieces... The frame around the puzzle needs to be connected before the puzzle picture can come into focus. The short prophetic puzzle pieces in this nutshell epilogue will be put at the end of all my future videos in order to reveal the 10 biblical proofs that I am depending upon as the foundation for teaching what the scripture reveals about the Lord's prophetic sabbatical 7,000 year calendar, the oldest biblical prophecy perspective in the entire world. To accomplish this in 15 minutes means I am only presenting a very brief and abbreviated summary of a corpus of my own published and unpublished videos and articles produced in the past 10 years that are hundreds of hours long, distilled and condensed to a brief overview in the hope that this will give you the confidence to explore in much greater depth the prophetic vistas published in this and upcoming videos. So this will not answer all your questions, but it will answer the question, How do I know the dates I'm disclosing are correct? After all, a 7,000-year prophetic calendar with an incorrect and unreliable start date, well, it may get close to the mark, and 100 years ago would have been interesting, a novelty. 50 years ago, it would have been very interesting, and 10 years ago, it would have been exciting. But producing such a calendar months before it is announcing the departure of the church? 
Well, you better know what you're talking about, and your sources better be impeccable. So yes, I am not unaware of the risks of producing something that ends up being wrong. I'm more aware of the risk of sitting on my hands when there is urgent need for saints and sinners to know where we are on God's prophetic time clock. I am confident that what I am sharing is correct. The question remains, who am I listening to? What are my sources? How in the world can I know that the dates I am depending upon to come to my conclusions are correct? Let's begin with the question I get most often that is also the key date that unlocks most of the other prophetic dates on God's 7,000-year calendar. So question one, how do I know that Yeshua died on the cross on Nisan 14, April 5th in 30 AD on the Roman calendar? Obviously, there are many proofs of this historically recognized date. But how do I know that 30 AD is the crucifixion date of Yeshua? Now, at this point, I could spend an hour explaining all this and hardly scratch the surface. And it would be worth watching. But please remember, this is a Bible prophecy summary in a very small nutshell. So let's begin. The answer is found in Ezekiel 4, verses 6 and 7. You might want to go and read the entire chapter. Listen to what the Lord told Ezekiel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. The time of iniquity prophesied by Ezekiel was 40 years to be followed by a siege of Jerusalem. The siege of Jerusalem, prophetically in view, happened exactly 40 years after the crucifixion of Yeshua that took place in 30 AD. In other words, the 70 AD siege of Jerusalem minus 40 years lands you or takes you back to the year 30 AD just as God said it would through his prophet Ezekiel. The iniquity of Judah was the worst crime ever committed on earth as it was the crucifixion of the Son of God. So the answer to the question, how do I know Jesus was crucified on Nisan 14, April 5th, 30 A.D.? Well, the Bible tells me so. Question two, how do I know Adam sinned in the year 3971? In Genesis 1.1, this question is answered in the first Hebrew word in the Bible. I call this the Bereshit Passover prophecy that reveals the first evangelium, the gospel story and pictures, and then based on the Hebrew script that is also Numbers, reveals the time duration in Numbers in the first word in the Bible, just like Isaiah prophesied in chapter 46, 9 and 10. Listen to what the prophet says. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. A word directly from God, spoken through the prophet Isaiah. The numeric time duration revelation is discovered in the word beginning, that is the last five letters in the six-letter word Bereshit, and it fulfills this prophecy. Ta 400 times Yod 10, God's multiplier, 10 being ordinal perfection, equals 4,000. 4,000 years takes us to the cross event. The cross event happened in 30 AD, so we go back in time, 4,000 years, and it reveals the year that the first Adam sinned in 3971. So, answer number two, how do I know Adam sinned on Elul 29 in 3971 BC? The Bible tells me so. Question three, how do I know that Yeshua was born in 5 BC? Well, this mystery is solved when you understand that the last Adam was patterning his life, death, and resurrection, that's Yeshua HaMashiach, in order to undo or reverse the curse of the first Adam that sinned. Since Adam was created on the sixth day of creation, on Tishri 6, and we know he sinned in the year 3971 BC, let's do the math. The life of Yeshua was about 30 years old when he began his three-and-a-half-year ministry that began in the fall and ended with his resurrection on Nisan 17, three days after his Wednesday crucifixion on Nisan 14. April 5th, 30 A.D. is when Jesus died on the cross. Thirty-three-and-a-half years times 365.25 equals 12,235 days. 
That's the number of days between the birth of Yeshua and his resurrection on April 8th, 30 A.D. If we go back 33 and a half years, 12,235 days from the resurrection of Yeshua starting the day count on the Sabbath of Nisan, 17, we land on Tishri 6 in the year 5 B.C. On the Roman calendar, this is October 8th, 5 B.C. Yeshua was born right in the middle of the period of time between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Isn't that interesting? But what is more interesting is that it is exactly the same month and year that Adam was created on the sixth day of the creation week. Pattern is prophecy. So answer number three, how do I know Yeshua was born in the fall of 5 BC? The Bible tells me so. Question four, how do I know the year of creation on the Roman calendar is 4005 BC? Well, the Tishri 6 birth of Yeshua matches perfectly the Tishri 6 creation of the first Adam. Tishri 6 in 5 BC on the Roman calendar in October 8th was when Jesus was born. Discovering the creation date can be calculated now that we know when Yeshua was born in 5 BC and when we know the duration of time and days between Yeshua's birth and his resurrection. We can now calculate when the first Adam was created and that year also give us the creation date as Adam was created on the sixth day of the first creation week. If we start from Elul 29, the day and month that ends the sabbatical year that the first Adam sinned in 3971, and go backwards in time, 12,235 days, we will discover the day and year that the first Adam was created. 3971 BC, going back 12,235 days on the 360 day for a year calendar that God established in the beginning, takes you to the 6th of Tishri in the creation week of 4005 BC. So the answer to number four is how do I know the creation date was Tishri 1, 4005 BC? The Bible tells me so. Question five How do I know? when the 7,000-year countdown for mankind ends. If we go back to the Bereshit Passover prophecy, we find the answer. The numeric time duration revelation is discovered in the first word in the Bible, the word beginning, that is the last five letters in the six-letter word Bereshit. Ta 400 times Yod 10 equals 4,000. From sin to the crucifixion of Yeshua that happened in 30 AD on the Roman calendar. The Yod 10 times Sheen, 300, plus 1 equals 3,001 years. Going forward 3,001 years from the cross event of 30 AD takes us to the very important future date on the Roman calendar of 3031 AD. The 7,000 year countdown on God's sabbatical calendar also takes us to the end of the millennial reign of Christ, who returns back to his home in heaven at the end of his 1,000 year reign that ends in 3031 AD. So answer 5. The 7,000 year countdown for mankind ends in 3031 AD. And this is also the time that concludes the 1,000 year reign of Yeshua on the earth. How do I know this? The Bible tells me so. If the 7,000 year countdown ends in the year 3031, then we now have a very important milestone by which we can authoritatively answer a couple more questions. So question number six, when is the second coming of Christ? The answer is 3031 AD, going back in time exactly 1,000 years, lands us on the year 2031 AD. This is the year of the second coming of Christ that begins the millennial reign of Yeshua. Answer 6. How do I know the second coming of Christ and the start date for the millennium is 2031 AD? The answer is the Bible tells me so. Question 7. Knowing that 2031 is the end of the 70th week of Daniel, we can go back in time exactly seven years and discover the very year that the 70th week of Daniel begins. So answer seven. The 70th week of Daniel begins in the year 2024 AD. 2024 AD is the year that the 70th week of Daniel begins ending seven years later on the Day of Atonement on a Jubilee year that ends with the second coming of Yeshua in 2031 AD to reign in Jerusalem with a rod of iron for exactly 1,000 years. And so the time of Jacob's trouble ends in 2031 AD. 
Question number eight. When does the 6,000 years God appointed for man to work come to an end? Going backwards in time, 3,000 years from the conclusion of the 7,000-year sabbatical calendar gives us the date for the beginning of the fifth day on God's 1,000-year-for-a-day calendar, confirming that it begins the year after the crucifixion of Yeshua in 30 A.D. It begins in 31 A.D. To be clear, the fifth day begins in 31 A.D. and ends in 1031 A.D., and the sixth day begins in 1031 A.D. and ends in 2031 A.D. on the Roman calendar. And finally, the seventh day begins in 2031, and on the Roman calendar it ends in 3031 A.D. So the answer to question 8, the sixth day that the Lord prophesied would be the 6,000th and final year for man to work begins in 1031 A.D. and ends in 2031 A.D. on the Roman calendar. Question number nine. And when did the prophetic 7,000-year sabbatical calendar begin? So going back 7,000 years from 3031 A.D. lands us on the year 3970 B.C., the year after the sin of Adam, the first Adam that sinned in 3971 B.C. So check your own date duration calendar and you will discover that the number of years between 3970 B.C. and 3031 A.D. is exactly 7,000 years. I know it looks like it's 7,001, but it's not. This is correct. Remember, we have a problem every time we go between B.C. and A.D. as we have to make a correction. And keep in mind the second proof of this date based on the fact that pattern is prophecy. And so when you go forward 35 years from the creation date of 4005, we land on the end of the fifth and the beginning of the sixth sabbatical cycle, the sixth sabbatical year that begins in the year 3970 after completing five sabbatical years after creation date of 4005 B.C. So answer number nine, the 7,000 year sabbatical prophetic calendar began the countdown to eternity in the year 3970 B.C. It is interesting that the first sabbatical week of years was interrupted by the sin event that took place in 3971, exactly 34 years from creation to sin. And when does sinful man need a savior? The answer is after the sin of Adam in 3971 that corrupted all mankind and left us without hope until we were rescued by the grace of God based on the finished work of Yeshua as he paid the penalty for our sins on a wooden cross 1994 years ago in the year 30 A.D. Does 34 years complete the fifth sabbatical year from creation? The answer is no. But 35 does, as 35 is divisible by 7 with no remainder, further confirming the start date of the Lord's sabbatical 7,000-year calendar from mankind in 3970 B.C. And finally, question number 10. How do I know when Yeshua is coming back to take us home? The answer is, I don't. But I do know this. It's soon. Very soon.